Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to virtual events in an IRL world. Um, I am Jordan Newman. I am the head of sales and partnerships at Hovercast. We make a tool set for virtual events and live streams. Um, basically, we let you build interactive graphics like fundraising meters and other cool stuff. Uh, it connects to Act Blue. Um, our technology is powered events for Bernie Sanders, AOC, a whole bunch of state parties, including every one of the panelists who are here. Um, the panelists for this session are pretty incredible. Um, they have powered some truly head-turning moments in virtual events from Bernie Sanders' uh, pre-New Hampshire rally with the Strokes to the Wisdom's Princess Bride reunion. Basically, we saw an emergence of a whole new category of digital engagement that was built by the people on this panel. They know what works, what doesn't, how to promote events, how to maximize participation during an event. Um, speaking of which, I will be asking some questions of my own, but we will also be checking the chat throughout. So please chime in, help guide the conversation. And you know, sometimes it's hard to hype yourself up while, while you're introducing yourself without sounding like a jerk. So I'm gonna give them a hand to introduce the panel. I'm gonna hype up our panelists because I want you to know how incredible they are. Um, so with that, Shasti Conrad. Shasti was the director of surrogates for Bernie Sanders in 2020. She's currently the chair of the King County Democrats. She has thrown some incredible virtual events. Two of her virtual fundraisers, Lift Every Voice and Elect Black Women, the pre-funk party. They won Polly Awards this year uh, for best fundraiser. And that's because they were spectacular. She has a great sense of what works, how to draw a crowd virtually, and how to create events in partnership with organizations like Color of Change, Higher Heights Pack, Collective Pack, and Control Z. Chuck Engel is the digital media director for the Wisconsin Democratic Party, otherwise known as the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. His team has put together some of the most successful and buzziest virtual fundraisers of all time. The DPW's Princess Bride reunion raised over $4 million and earned a spot as a finalist for Ad Week's Ad of the Year category. Um, Chuck can speak to what it takes to put these sorts of reunion and script reading events together, market them, and, and maximize how much they raise. And then our, our third panelist is Albert Negretti, who is a top shelf producer for ACT TV. ACT TV runs live video productions for some of the biggest names in progressive politics. They've streamed rallies for Bernie Sanders. They've produced events for Pramila Jayapal, Indivisible, and a conference that you may have heard of called Netroots Nation. Okay, so here we are, we're at a conference that was going to be in person and is now virtual. And we've had to shift from IRL to virtual for a lot of events. And a lot of times we think of what the trade-offs are that come with that. But I wanna start on more of a positive note. So Shasi, what's something that works better in a virtual environment? Well, I mean, I think definitely accessibility and, and in all the ways, meaning that, you know, look, we all are in different parts of the country right now and we're able to have this conversation. And then, you know, you also are able to have, um, you know, uh, interpret ASL interpretation, you can have transcription, you can have language translation. There's all kinds of really cool ways that you can engage people who oftentimes aren't able to you know, go to things in person for a variety of reasons. And that is something that I think we should absolutely keep um, in, as we move forward, no matter what happens um, with this pandemic, I really hope that we keep those a part of these events. Chuck, the same question to you. What's, what's something that's positive about running events virtually? Um, one of the positive things is um, being able to pull together a cast of talent that is anywhere and a very diverse cast th uh, through that. Um, I, I, I think of the one example, we did a comedy event last cycle that uh, we were able to uh, bring in Will Forte to do a live thing. And he was on location in Australia um, and, you know, halfway around the world get, getting up. I forget if he was getting up early or late for us. 
Um, but yeah, it was uh, just you know being able to like get him, uh, have him involved was a big part of the uh, comedy event that we did last cycle. Um, yeah, and just you know being able to like like Shasti said, like bring more people in. Um, in terms of an audience, it, it's more accessible. There's more ways to interpret, um, you know, the, just a, technology helps you interpret things more uh, through the virtual space. Albert, you've done some similar events that have people from kind of all over. Is that is that something that you're sort of sort of big on with the the concept of virtual events? Yeah, I, I really think that it's really interesting to be able to pull people from very different places and also um, sort of narrow the focus, right? So a, a virtual event allows you to create something and put and get people together that would probably not be able to go to a geographical location because, um, you know, there's interests uh, that might not be determined by a geographical location. Uh, this conference, Networks Nation, is usually hosted in DC, right? Um, so the fact that you can bring people that are interested in progressive politics, for example, but they're, that are not in the DC area, and, and that you can narrow them down to like this panel, for example, which is like virtual events and hovercast, and uh, that people that are only interested in this thing are able to come all the way here, without actually leaving their home. It's, it's, I think it's, it's really interesting. And I don't think there's a way to do that in person. I wanna talk about one of the foundational documents for not just virtual events, any event, but, but virtual events in particular, which is a run of show. Um, Shasti, how important is a good run of show? It's the base for everything. Um, I. I love actually doing runs of shows. Like it's my favorite part because you get to think about the content. You get to think about the messaging. You get to think about who you want to engage. Um, who are you trying to reach? And, you know, um, in this, in a virtual environment, you know, a lot of times run of shows, you know, um, you're trying to make it so that you are able to capture people's attention. Um, you know, folks, like we all know, I think we're all probably pretty zoomed out these days of having to go from like, you know, a video conference one to video conference number two all day long every day. And so with a run of show, you really are trying to design something that is going to um, grab people's attention, keep them inspired, keep them engaged. You wanna um, make sure that your asks for whether it's fundraising or it's volunteering or engagement in some kind, are spread throughout the event because you will have sometimes a different audience at the beginning of event than you will have at the end. You know, people come in and out because they're able to. And so you wanna make sure that you're you're being able to reach them throughout that whole program. Um, for our events, we love music. Um, we love to be able to keep something that sort of breaks up some of the monotony of a lot of speeches or, you know, kind of um, sometimes you have really great panels like this, but you want a little something to jazz it up. And so we love being able to kind of create visually compelling content um, with some great energy to hold people's attention for for at least an hour so yeah I love runs of shows they're the, they're the most fun to create Albert how do you spread out a good run of show like how do you how do you kind of divvy up you have a lot of really interesting speakers maybe someone is the most interesting or the biggest draw where do you put them in a show well, there's no one answer, and it's definitely very, it's like the secret sauce of all of this, right? Um, um, I remember going on the Bernie campaign when it was like before COVID, when it was on the ground. And the, the way these events are designed was basically everything was building up to the big speech of Bernie Sanders at the end, right? And like all these speakers were sort of like introducing and warming up the audience. But you can't really do that in a, in a virtual event because especially those that are on social media, people can come in and out, as, as Shanta Chasti was saying, so quickly that you need to keep them engaged from minute one. So you need to sort of spread out the most important moments or characters of the, of the event um, and make sure that you honor, you know, the people in between as well. And it's, it's like, it's, it's, really, it's really complicated, but I would say that... Um, the the sort of gradual build up scheme that that works in, in physical events is just not 
not like the way you do it individually. It has to be more like little peaks here and there and there and there. And I, I like a lot what, what Chastity was saying about introducing music to sort of like break the monotony and, and keep the audience engaged. Because like music does play really well um, on, you know, social media and the videos and it's like visually very interesting. Um, it's also very challenging because all the copyright stuff, right? Like you need to, <laughs> needs to be original music and cleared and all these things. But, but yeah, um, definitely you have to introduce new elements to keep the people there because they can leave so quickly. So, and Chuck, if you, if you ultimately are holding an event that's centered on sort of like an action that you want the audience to take, a call to action, how do you incorporate that? Like, who do you have as part of the show who's, who's making that ask? Yeah, something we do is we've, started to utilize our um, our chair, Ben Wickler, who's just a very talented and charismatic guy, um, as kind of a host. And if not him, um, you know, someone else, the, um, you know, the Princess, the Princess Bride uh, event had a host. And we, um, you know, we, we, we basically script in the ask right up front. You know, we make it very clear, like, what this is for, kind of make our mission statement, like, you know, kind of like our opening pitch. And then we kind of turn it over to the the talented cast. That's kind of how we have really like baked in the, you know, the purpose. And then we we bring it up again like throughout the run of show. We'll um, we'll have you know special guests like Governor Evers popping up um, all of a sudden, and you know making just kind of the you know the the pitch and like the purpose all, clear all over again. So let's talk about let's talk about those goals. Do you, I'll, I'll go to Albert, like, do you go in with any specific goals about fundraising? Do you kind of like anchor an event around an ask in, in concept? Yes. And, and obviously that depends on the campaign and what it is, right? Sometimes it's raising this X amount of money um, and sometimes it's, you know, getting engagement here and there. And when a client comes and, and, um, you know, wants to get something, we, we try to like, you know, give them advice on which is the best way to, to honor this request. Um, yes, for example, for fundraising, um, I think it's important to have a goal um, and also a realistic one, because, you know, especially if you have it on screen, and we've had it in the past actually with, with Hovercast, um, you want to make sure that you reach it or you almost reach it, right? Because like, I don't think it looks, it, it looks nice if, if you have like a super unrealistic goal and then nobody, nobody reaches it. Like, um, I think it's part of, it's part of our job as producers to also give realistic expectations to the clients and um, they can, and, and see like if their goals are, are not achievable. But like in general, we, we, we have a lot of tools to help them reach the goals that they want. And um, yeah, we're, we're here to solve problems. I would just I'd okay, very no. quickly <laughs> add, it could be it could be super fun when you can celebrate a goal uh, hitting its mark. So, you know, you can do like really fun things with a meter celebration. I know with um, uh, with some of the events that we had with Chuck and Shasti, we had like really interesting um, shaped meters and you know, like kind of why I think there was for a happy days reunion, there was a milkshake meter. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot in a cheese meter for, uh, for one of them. So that can, that can definitely be um, like a joyful uh, event. And it's like a dopamine release that you want to, you, you definitely want to include and everyone feels better about the event when you can, when you can do something like that. Um, someone was about to jump in uh before was, about about yeah i was just gonna say yeah i mean on the fundraising part and yeah jordan hovercast is so excellent at creating these like really um fun sort of fundraising thermometer types you know and and you um you do really individualize it to the different projects which was so great for our lift every voice one you did um a music scale that had the notes for the beginning of lift every voice and um but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we as the sort of, you know, producers for the event will kind of help manage for the client. Like, let's let's set a realistic goal that we will definitely hit. 
so that people get really excited and feel like they've accomplished something and then ask them to like, let's hit the next goal. And um, Chuck can probably talk about, I know there are a couple of events that they did where it was like, there were special prizes or additional things that would happen um, if you hit those goals. But I think, um, you know, you sort of precede some of it, you know, some of that money comes in before the actual day of the event so that you have a sort of sense of what that base is. And then, you know, you can try to encourage to raise during the event. Um, we also always tell clients, like, we love to produce um, content that can be, that's like shorter, um, almost like an ad type of content that can be used for after the event to be able to help promote what we just did, help to fundraise off of it. Sometimes you do a highlights reel from the event that then you can use for further fundraising beyond it. One of the nice things about doing events in a virtual world is that you can create content that can live beyond that one particular moment. And that definitely helps with with fundraising. And then really quick, I see in the chat some of my Northwest friends. So I just want to say hi, everybody. I can't I can't chat back at you, but I see you and appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, that's such a good point about the afterlife of a live event. Uh, Chuck, you all have done some like really interesting things after an event has taken place. Like, I, how much did you say the Princess Bride has raised after the event ended? Oh boy, I don't, I don't have that figure um, handy, but I mean, it, it has, you know, it, it created such a buzz that event. It was such a unique thing that we were able to re remarket the watching the replay of it. Um, and that became a whole thing, and that and that became uh, you know very uh, you know like grassroots level donate any amount to watch the replay um, sort of circumstance, and um, also also within the with within the planning, you know our um, our our communications team is working these events also. They're you know. Started. We wound up in this position where we were pitching entertainment stories to people, um, and you know our political staff was never in that position before. But it was a lot of fun, and um, afterwards we were able to, with the with the um, you know the celebrities that we were working with, we were able to like get them like um, Today Show spots and like morning show things to, you know, it, it, once again like you know get up in front of eyeballs and reiterate the mission and talk about you know what they were doing with the wisconsin democrats and you know all of that just like you know perpetuates the buzz and yeah being able to have somewhat of an all hands on deck uh, situation with your live event if you're going to invest the time in it it can really pay dividends i mean it definitely makes things easy when you have a like sort of a seminal moment <laughs> taking place um so not everyone who's watching is going to have access to top tier talent, but there are certainly scales of how big an event is and how, how big an event has to be for something that's more regional or uh, down ballot. But I mean, let's talk about the, the talent recruitment portion of this. And, and Chuck, just to stay on, on you for a quick sec here, can you talk about the genesis of some of these sort of building on the relationships that already existed or the natural kind of tie-ins to Wisconsin? Um, yeah, so I, Wisconsin is lucky enough to have um, a few notable celebrities, including Mark Ruffalo and um, Bradley Whitford. Um, and th these folks are, you know, very engaged in our cause. So we're able to leverage those relationships to, you know, bigger things. Um, we also worked with, um, you know, some consultants who specialize in you know, just like connecting, you know, people of like certain statures, uh, celebrities, things like that to causes that they're passionate about and helping them, you know, kind of just put put their money towards, and if not their money, their their time and their labor and their effort towards like helping to support these causes. Um, you know, I, I'm not super close with the uh, relations end of these things, but, you know, I, I feel like Shasti might be able to speak uh, more closely to you know, how those relationships can come to be. Yeah, take it away, Shasti. Sure, yeah. Well, so um, when I was director of surrogates at Bernie, which I always have to make the joke, it's like not what LA surrogates tend to think. It's like all these activists and artists and policymakers and elected officials who basically want to, you know, um, support the campaign, support the candidate. Um, and so we were able to cultivate 
really awesome people who wanted to lend their influence and their support, like Chuck said, you know, their time, their resources um, to to the campaign, to progressive causes. When that campaign ended, you know, those folks are still like they many of them were kind of learning about political engagement and civic engagement and were really energized by the Bernie movement and didn't want it to end like a lot of us. And so then, you know, as we sort of shifted into doing everything we could to make sure that we defeated Trump and that we, you know, won those like Georgia seats and we helped with um, local elections across the country, you know, we had this base of incredible folks, you know, like, like the Mark Ruffalo's and the, um, you know, um, Halsey and the strokes and people like that who really wanted to do what they could because they they cared. You know, this stuff actually really does matter to them. And so a lot of it is just building these relationships. And, um, you know, like like Chuck said, you know, when I, I was on Bernie, you know, we would look for what were those natural connections. So we would if we were going to Iowa, we would sort of look up like who um, who went to school in Iowa, you know, who grew up in Iowa, who has a family member that is working in Iowa, you know, like, what are those sort of natural connections? Or, you know, did a film that's really well known in the, in a certain place or something like that. And then we would sort of, we would try to uh, build something kind of around those connections. Um, it didn't happen in a virtual environment. But um, on the Bernie campaign in 2019, we had this really wonderful sort of magic happen, which is Jack White. Um, we just so happened to be doing an event at his old high school in Detroit. And he had never, um, he'd never really done anything political. And we just sort of on a whim, we looked up who had connections to Detroit, saw, you know, that he was, he, he had gone to school there and grew up there. And we just reached out to him and he was like, okay, like I'm, I believe in Bernie, but also it's my old high school. And so, you know, looking for those types of relationships really matters. And now in a virtual environment, it's so much easier because they can be on set, like Chuck said, you know, like they can be in Australia working on a film and still call in and participate in something. And, you know, most of the time, you know, they just want to do it because they care about the cause. Um, sometimes, you know, especially this past year with artists who make most of their, um, you know, kind of they, they make their, their um, earnings off of touring and produ like doing their music, we wanted to make sure that they would get that they got paid. So if there were local artists that we were working with, we definitely would make sure that they would get paid for, for their labor to um, sing a song or to send us a video or something like that. So it's interesting when we're talking about kind of like how to, how to source uh, talent because so much of it is about like the draw of getting eyeballs in in the first place. It's, it's not only the content of the show, but it's a marketing tactic. And... Albert, I, I was hoping you could speak to some of the ways that you can crowd build, that you can draw, build a crowd um, with uh, social media tactics, with sort of community building, all, all that sort of stuff that I know you've, you've been great at. So um, I think that there's like a balance between the, the, um, the audience that your talent attracts, right? And that's why having big names is important. And the audience that you can build by just creating coalitions and like establishing relationships with uh, with uh, activists or, or you know groups that have similar interests to yours, and ultimately it's this sort of symbiosis between uh, the people that want to be heard and the people that want to have content, so their messages are also heard. That um, that that builds this bigger audience, right? And like, for example, Facebook has uh, this beautiful tool that's called cross-posting, where you can establish relationships uh, with, with other pages. And then when you post up an event or a stream or whatever, um, it goes automatically to all of their audience as well. Um, there's, there's, you know, other ways you can have celebrities repost things or like, um, cut little pieces of your event and then use, uh, make that, make, the speakers or whoever is interested in like that particular topic that this segment of the event was about to share it. Um, it's really about uh, making sure that you serve the interest of the cause and of everyone that's involved in the cause. Because, um, for example, I've seen I see here in the chat that like one of the question was, uh, how do you get big names to donate their time to your cause? Right. I would not say 
uh, donate really because like it's it's a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship here. Uh, the the big names or names of any size get uh, a platform and a chance to push their costs forward, and uh, you get you know all this audience that this big name attracts. So they're just as interested in 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 pushing and in, in, in participating in an event that they care about. It's really all about finding the right match, right? Because um, you know you're not gonna ask. Bernie Sanders to do something about oil, for example, right? Like you need, <laughs> you need um, to find the right quote unquote celebrities for your event. And uh, if you match the right audience with the right celebrities, then the relationship is going to be there. There's no big secret. And our host disappeared. <laughs> I went to unmute and I did the video <laughs> one instead. I'm such a doofus. Okay. Um, <laughs> Shasi, I wanted to uh, kick it over to you. I know you've done some really interesting things with, um, I, I think what Albert was talking about, cross-posting in particular, but sort of using using um, social media to your advantage when it comes to live. Yeah. So the concert that we did last year, Lift Every Voice, which was to benefit um organizations that were particularly focused on turning out black voters. Um, you know, we we were uh, putting a program together that featured sort of soul R&B singers like Patti LaBelle, Shaka Khan, um, B.B. Winans, people like that. And, um, and so one of the asks that we made for like, not only will you participate in the program, but will you cross post on your social media channels and, you know, share our event. And that was really like one of the biggest ways that we built an audience. Um, we cross post with um, Patti LaBelle, Shaka Khan and Jason Mraz. And just by them sharing it, you know, they have millions and millions of followers. And so by cross posting, then it appears and it's like, Hey, check this out right now. And suddenly, you know, you have a bunch of eyes on your um, on your event because of that cross posting. And I do think what Albert was saying is is right on about like making sure that it's the right fit. Um, and sometimes, you know, you like you think that like the biggest star is going to be what draws in, but it's like if you're trying to reach a particular audience, sometimes it's a TikTok star. You know, sometimes it's um, sometimes it's like a local elected official or local activist that really gets that particular audience really jazzed. And, you know, they have the, the sort of right pull for for whatever cause or, or candidate that you're trying to um, build an audience for. That's a great point. Also, um, I've seen measurement of how well each of the influencers are bringing in causes and you can do that with uh, link tagging on the social posts to make sure that each person has a unique, you know, what, whatever it is, like a, uh, a modifier on the URL. Um, so there are some, there are some cool ways to do that. And it's not always what you expect. Um, like what Chastie was, was saying there. Um, Chuck, I know you've, I've been really impressed with the sort of advertising that your team has done in the run up to some of the virtual events. Could you speak a little bit about that? How you generate the content for the ads, what you, what you sort of look for and, and in targeting and uh, yeah, how, how that all, uh, you know, makes the event better. Yeah. Um, it's really, it, it, it's, Part of our workflow from the beginning is, you know, setting up a, a brand for the event, like number one, and then an ActBlue contribution page where people can get um, access or get tickets to the event. Um, and everything, you know, drives back to that ActBlue page for the event. Um, we work with the people who will be working with on the uh, live event, whoever is going to be, you know, our talent for the event to uh, do direct to camera videos, uh, and we target on Facebook and we do a mix of like, you know, targeting to uh, people who are interested in, you know, like just like Patton Oswalt, like other things like he was in into or, you know, other things he appeared in. And then also, you know, just our core, you know, grassroots supporters. And we do lookalike audiences with, you know, big names like uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, like, you know, whatever. Facebook will allow us to do and it's kind of like a in terms of targeting it's that, that, that's kind of like the foundation of it 
And it's just a matter of like how much content can we generate uh, within the lead up of the event and, um, you know, just talk about it that way. And additionally, we have our communications team like putting out press releases about the event and really like trying to work with media to you know earn a little bit of attention for the event as well. Um, I'm cracking up at the comment that just came in about Stephanie's famous cousin. Very curious who it is, but uh, you don't have to tell us. Um, yeah, it's uh, Shasi. I, I know that you've you've sort of like made specific outreach outreach to uh, various influencers. How when does that panned out? When it's just sort of like random uh, outreach. Yeah, I was going to say one of the things that, um, you know, was a change in the last cycle than how I remember campaigns previously um, is that so much of outreach can really happen through Twitter <laughs> and these relationships can build. Whereas like, you know, the old days you um, would have to you have to go through an agent and a publicist and you have to do all of these things to be able to get to to talent. And now um a lot of people have open dms and, and they will actually respond so um it was actually our social media um director georgia park on the bernie campaign who ariana grande um was uh putting out a new album and sort of said something i can't remember the name of the song but it was something that was sort of like oh you know what do you want what do you need kind of thing and um georgia as bernie <laughs> with the bernie official account sort of replied and was like medicare for all and it kicked off this kind of funny you know back and forth between the bernie account and ariana grande and that was enough for then you know her manager to get in touch and we got in, in touch with um her team and sort of said like we'd love to make something happen. Wouldn't it be fun to do something with, with Bernie and Ariana? And it was the night before the debate in Atlanta and she was doing a big concert. And so we brought Bernie in to go to her, to go to her show, meet her backstage. And that was the famous photo that the two of them took together that then was seen by like, you know, 300 million people, you know, around the world. It was like, you know, it just went, it went so viral and, and, um, you know, just having that little interaction was enough to spark this kind of fun relationship that then got more eyes and Ariana got to talk about the work that she was doing around helping to get young people registered to vote. And, um, you know, and then obviously it was really great to have that sort of sign of support for Bernie. And so those types of things can happen in a virtual environment, online, social media environment that it's sometimes a lot harder to actually create um, in real life. So Lots of really good opportunities for that. And I wanted to add on that um, and following up with like the the comment the comment about um, that there's this person in the chat that that says that they uh, they get an audience by basically talking about politics with their their relative that's like a famous person on Twitter, right? Um, this explains how much uh, how important content is, right? Because like okay, so in this case the sort of discussing politics with this person and having this kind of argument uh, is something that creates an audience and gets and, and reaches a lot of people because of how the algorithms work, right? Um, seeing Bernie Sanders and Ariana Grande together and interacting and everything, that's amazing content. And that's why it reaches 300 million people. Um, and I think there's, there's something that we... Um, you know, we, everyone as in the world of events have not super mastered yet, uh, which is getting away from just, for example, talking heads and turning things into more like visually interesting. Like, I don't know, uh, imagine a live stream where you could be like playing some game that like does some visual thing. Um, all these things that when somebody scrolls down this, the, 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 the feed, it's not just another head talking, but there's actually something happening um that's how you capture like bigger audiences and the, the fact uh, is that because facebook and, and twitter and all these things work uh by showing content that people have stopped on they show it to even more people if you do something that people will stop to see then more people will see it and and yeah um i think it's not only it's not only reaching out to like you know the right pages and everything but like really making Re, uh, amazing and compelling content. 
Um, one of the one of the other things that Hovercast has done before is sort of gamify social engagement, where uh, you can throw a poll on screen that says "vote in the chat," and it's not as overt a call to action, or is it's not a, as overt a thing where it would get flagged by Facebook as sort of like uh, uh, trying to trick the algorithm. But it does it does happen to be that every time you show a poll on screen and people are voting in the chat, it is the most engaged moment of a virtual event, bar none. Um, so it really is a good way to get people to, you know, lean forward a little bit. And you can do that without the technology for it. You can really just ask people questions and say, you know, uh, engage in the chat. And that will, as soon as you enter any sort of text onto a, uh, onto a post where there's a video, you're just more likely to be sticking around because you've got some skin in the game. It's a, it's a cool little uh, tactic that you can feel free to employ. Um, I have a question and this is gonna, we're gonna make our way around to everybody, but what department does a virtual event live in? Uh, Chuck, you're, you're in the digital realm, but it's, you know, you're talking about fundraising, you're talking about comms, like who owns this and who should own it? Um, yeah, it starts in the digital team. It starts in, um, you know, digital, but I mean, we're working, it's, a, it, I've said it already, it's a all hands on deck situation. Like, you know, it's digital's project, but we have finance involved in it. We have um, our comms team helping, you know, earn media around it and then like make sure it, you know, perpetuates. And, you know, our, like everyone from the executive director on down is kind of involved in it to a certain extent. Um, and, you know, that really has helped make it, you know, a quality event. And we've been in um, circumstances where we're, you know, working with others to write a run, run of show or writing it completely in house. And, you know, like last cycle, our finance director was working on the run of show with people. It really just, it, I don't, I'm not even sure how that happened, but it, it happened. And yeah, it, it really, it lives with digital, but it really takes over our whole organization. And I think like, that's what makes it successful. Shasti, I, I want to get your take on this too. And, and also think about it in terms of like, how would you sell this up in an organization that hasn't done an event like this before? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Chuck's right on, which is it really does like touch kind of like every part of a typical like either campaign or, you know, organizations kind of different departments. Um, I, you know, when I was on in the Bernie world, you know, I was a surrogate director. And so a lot of it would come from like, you know, the talent ideas or from the States would ask for something. Now I operate as a sort of consultant for different clients um, on these different projects. And, you know, sometimes it's, um, especially in this past year with the pandemic and everything, it's like people are used to doing like their annual gala and it was a lot of like, oh, no, we can't do our typical like salmon dinner, you know, gala event that raises what we need for the, you know, the, the next year's operating budget. You know, what what can we do? How do we do that in a um, in a in, in a virtual environment? And so some of the work that I as a consultant have have to do is kind of help move people along to understand that, you know, they might have been they might have been willing to spend, you know, $30,000 on those salmon plate dinners um, for a crowd, well, you still do need to pay people well to produce a virtual event. You want it to be compelling content that takes, you know, um, speakers and talent. It takes a producer like myself to help do that outreach to bring people together. You need to pay someone who can help with the fundraising. You need to pay, you know, Hovercast to be the platform to, to do that. You need to pay um, a video crew um, to be able to produce really great content. Like, you know, there are these different pieces and it's it's actually worth the money to make that investment. There's a, a greater ROI when it's great content. And like we talked about earlier, content that you can use after the event later on throughout the year and get that sort of double, triple tap from it. Um, and and so, yeah, that's been part of the the work is trying to teach people to understand that this is actually worth the investment of, of a good team to be able to produce something really special. And Albert, I want to kick it over to you as well. And something that you might have kind of a unique perspective in is resistance or 
risk aversion in the organizations that you work with? Like what, what are, what are some of the, you had mentioned some like kind of cool tactics, like neat, innovative tactics that you would want to push. Where do you see the pushback and how do you sort of try to sell that up in an organization that you're working with? Well, um, organizations ultimately want results, right? So it's really hard to sell something that's new, that's different, that is not proven to be successful, right? Um, and I would say that ultimately it comes down to like creating this trust relationship with, with the client. And if we offer them something that's like very cool and interesting and they know that when we come up with crazy ideas, we deliver and they turn out to be cool, um, then then they are more keen to, to helping. But it's true that, um, you know, it also can grow <laughs> very easily um, and you need to sort of... Um, you know, narrow down uh, what what the events can be. And um, I can get super uh, worked up and, and have amazing ideas and like, and be like, oh yeah, we could do this and that and that. But then uh, <laughs> ultimately there needs to be some grounding. And uh, the, 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 the person that, that I can talk to with the, the you know, with the client, um, they can be very interested, but they will have to report to somebody in the finance department, for example, that will only want to pay for this, this, and this. So uh, there's always this sort of, you know, fight between, you know, the, the more creative, crazy side, let's do something amazing. And the more like, let's be realistic. Let's like make sure that we don't uh, risk too many things. And yeah, I mean, you know, same thing happens for, movies and then for real life events too right like um i'm sure that not every event needs a chocolate fountain but some people want to pay for a chocolate fountain and some people don't uh so and i don't know what return on investment a chocolate fountain has um so exactly <laughs> so when you don't know um how good something is gonna go you 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 have clients that are happier to take risks and you have clients that are just not. And it's just a relationship. That's a, that's a great point. Um, all right. So join me in a fantasy, a, a hopeful <laughs> fantasy where we live in a world where uh, Netroots Nation isn't can there isn't a uh, turn to, to a virtual event where we can have these in-person events in the same way that we used to pre, you know, February, March of 2020. Where does virtual programming fit into all of that? Um, Shasti, do you, are you still going to be doing virtual events? And, and how would you decide what is virtual and what is in person? Yeah, I mean, I, I think virtual events are here to stay. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing um, you know, different kind of uh, people trying to experiment with different hybrid models, you know, um, uh, earlier this year, like I, I love movies. So I um, Sundance Film Festival did like kind of a hybrid model a little bit where they, um, you were able to watch, you know, the new films from home and things like that. And I think, you know, as we do get back to maybe bigger like music festivals and things like that, there will be an opportunity to be able to watch from home. Um, and be able to see what's live where people who are more comfortable being in larger crowds can be there in person, but people who aren't or, you know, live across the country and I can't physically be there are going to be able to participate. And so I think, you know, there's a really cool opportunity we have to um, think outside of the box, like think about different ways to be able to engage, different ways to sort of do re relationship building as well. Um, you know, I'm the, the chair of our county party out here in, in Washington state. And, you know, we have an executive board of about 70 people. And, you know, before the pandemic, we would have monthly um, in-person meetings where, you know, the county is quite big. So, you know, a lot of people would have to drive a full hour to get to that meeting to be able to make it once a month. You know, now we've just decided like, you know, actually we have better engagement. Um, we have people like, you know, parents who a seven o'clock meeting or you have to drive an hour and drive another hour home that cuts right into bedtime. So normally, you know, they were just tuned. They were just like, well, I can't participate now. Now those folks are able to, they're able to join. They're able to contribute. We have um, elderly folks who are now are more comfortable with 
um, you know, being able to just hop online or, you know, folks with disabilities. And that's something that, like, I wouldn't want to give up at all. And so, you know, there's definitely the in-person part of it that we miss, the socializing, the, you know, the meeting after a meeting where you go out for a beer. And I think, um, you know, moving forward, we'll probably do larger, um, you know, like social events, maybe once a year or, or quarterly. But for the sort of more regular business that can happen online, we're definitely sticking with that. And I want to add to that, that um, also in these two years of pandemic, uh, the technology to accommodate uh, hybrid events has gotten so much better. Um, you're, you're able to, you know, broadcast real life events with like very li- like very uninvasive uh, camera crews and gear. And um, you don't, you no longer need that big like satellite truck outside of the, of the venue sort of, switching and broadcasting and like a team of 50 people just to run an event. Like, uh, for example, um, a couple of weeks ago, we were, we were uh, running the uh, March on Washington Film Festival and it was on site in DC. And we had two camera people there that were not even connected to each other. They were all in their live view systems and they were streaming uh, the video to us. And we were putting it together from our, from our studio here. So, um, and also, they were their cameras were also feeding the monitors inside of the event. Um, so we were able to sort of put together um, a hybrid event, right, and and feed uh, content to an audience online without really disturbing um, what was happening in, in in the venue. And I think this was just not that easy before COVID, and like people would just not put effort in in making content online because they were just all about the in-person event but during this year everyone has seen the value of reaching out to people outside of those four walls and we all like 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 Shasti was saying we all miss you know the the mingling in person and the and the dinner and the chocolate fountain and all these things but um we are I don't think there's going to be a moment where like the broadcasting the event out to the people that can't be there is going to be just out of the picture because there's there are two different audiences and and I, I like how it's just getting to a point where like the two audiences are important and they're I think they're both staying I love that I love that and and sort of like a lot of where uh some of these events kind of started was you know, pre pre-pandemic you know as, whether it's the, the satellite truck at a rally or just a phone that's live streaming an event, it's really getting this uh, national, sometimes global audience to be able to participate in something that's happening elsewhere. Chuck, are you going to go to Australia to meet with Will Forte in the future? Are you going to put a, a, a table read at an actual table at some point, like, wh- how are you conceptualizing some of these events? Do you do you have ideas of making them hybrid? Do you want to keep doing them virtual? What what is in the future for your, you all? Yeah, I think uh, you know, I in I guess for working at, for a state party, it's a matter of accessibility um, in creating a virtual element for you know people to be able to attend meetings and fundraisers and things like that who may otherwise not be able to be there in person. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think digital, and, and like a virtual will always be an element going forward to anything, I believe. Um, our next event that we're planning for in November will be um, basically all virtual, like connecting people from across the country and a- across the world again into one thing. But I really you know, hope in the future that we will be, you know, bringing actual people together. There will be a more in-person, a more interactive element to things. Um, I'm thinking ahead to our next big fundraiser and how, you know, we'll like our next in-person thing, um, hoping to have a, like a camera crew covering it and create like a dial-in or, you know, Zoom element to, uh, as a tier, like, you know, as a fundraising tier. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's, 
we're all eager to get back to that chocolate fountain. I'm so <laughs> eager to do it. So, um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think everything's here to stay. I want a seafood tower. That's Ooh. what I want. Yeah, or the the nacho fountain is really good too. That's <laughs> oh. yeah. Um, let's talk about some stuff that maybe hasn't worked as well as we would have hoped. And we can make this as anonymous as we want. I know like some of us deal with client facing uh, stuff, but what what are some swings and misses that you sort of had learnings from? And Albert, I'll start with you. Oh boy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, there's been a lot of misses, obviously, and especially at the beginning of, of the pandemic and everything, when we were still sort of putting together this technology, right? Um, and uh, we've learned so much since. Uh, we've learned to have backups. We've learned to actually put enough people. We thought we, just like clients, um, have also started to learn this. We, we didn't think that it was that hard or required that much work and manpower to put together some of these virtual events, right? And sometimes we just found ourselves swamped in something that was not supposed to be that hard. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and then, you know, computers fail and people are also very zoomed out and people's internets like suck. And it's, yeah. <laughs> There's, the, I mean, of course, I can come up with a list of like a million mistakes that we've made and a million like failures and, and like little dis disasters that we've tried to mitigate like midair and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it, it's nice to see a learning curve and how we've like made our, our product more reliable and more interesting and more and try to appeal to the client's needs more. And we've, it, it's been, you know, something that we've worked on um and that's how you build you know products and and yeah we all had to learn how to do virtual events out of thin air and now we're all learning how to do hybrid events right and i'm sure that whatever i know now about hybrid events is gonna feel so stupid in like a year or two um and i'm gonna be like why was i doing this um but yeah it's life <laughs> Yeah, there's there's so much room for error. It's almost an unfair question because like literally so much goes wrong and so much is how well and gracefully you can paper over the things that aren't quite going yeah. uh, the way that, that you wanted. Yeah, and there's like every production, you know, be it one of these events, be it one of these live TV shows that you watch, there's always, always, always something that goes wrong, like 100%. And it, there's this beautiful art of like pretending that everything's okay and, and making the audience not see the mistake, but sometimes they do see it. Or like we've all been, we've all like been muted on Zoom and somebody had to be like, you're muted. And when that happens in a Zoom call, it's whatever. But when that's like on live TV, it's a little more embarrassing. But ultimately, you know, we're all human and we make mistakes and everyone forgives you for it. Yeah, did you see that idiot who turned his video off in the middle of this panel? <laughs> yeah, who could uh, do that? I, I will say it, it, it has been fun partially to see some of these like influencers from their own homes struggle in the same way that like we all do. I was watching um, President Obama did one a couple of weeks ago and like he had to be reminded to come off mute. And then there was, you know, in the background, you could hear it, Bo barking and you could, you know, and I just thought like, how human, you know, like he, like everybody else, like we're all in our houses trying to get through this stuff and we've got kids and dogs and all the things. And um, I, I, I actually still kind of love the oops, you know, like I love those kind of moments as long as it's not like, oh my God, the whole thing's like, you know, the whole video shut off and we can't get back on. That is a horrible feeling. Right. Um, you know. Yeah. The, the, it, the live element is really important and to allow that to be, I think is, you know, there is such thing as like over scripting and, um, you know, ha having space enough in your run of show for, you know, little oops things to happen. I mean, it's going to happen. It happens if you're on Broadway and, you know, or going to see, you know, a play or a concert or anything like that. It's those, you know, it's those just live moments. It's that, you know, that risk that you're kind of, you know, is also like an engaging element to, 
to watch. I want to do one quick call for questions if there's anything else that um, from the audience that we haven't gotten to. So, you know, fire it off in the chat if uh, if you want us to ask uh, other questions or address anything else. We have got about five minutes left, um, but we can, we can keep chatting. Um, Chuck, have you gone off script in certain events? Is there uh, is there anything where you kind of like found a good moment, deviated from the run of show in a fun way? Yeah, um, yeah. So the we did an event. We were doing a, a super bad cast reunion and watch party, and this is it. You know, something we did last cycle. It was a really great event. Um, it brought it together through um, Judd Apatow and our, the relationship we have with him. Um, you know, the idea was that we were going to have uh, Super Bad, the movie, playing up in one screen and then the cast kind of in a Zoom grid uh, off to the side. Um, and, you know, they were going to watch and comment. But really, like, no one watched the movie. It, we it, And eventually, like, we basically turned the sound all, almost all the way off on the movie. And it was just this fascinating conversation between you know, this panel of old friends. Um and they started talking about the the part in the movie when um, Jonah Hill's character has um, you know the thing they do the flashback with him as a young kid drawing penises on everything and these very elaborate penis drawings and um, like eventually I, for, I forget who was actually involved in this but they wound up texting the guy who had drawn all the penises for the super bad movie and we wound up um, auctioning off a brand new penis drawing. Um, and putting that up on screen and with a little blurb that said, um, bid now to get a penis drawing just like this one. And that was up on screen for a political fundraiser. You know, talk about being risk averse. That, <laughs> um, Yeah, so we had that up on screen for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And it drove, you know, a couple more thousand dollars worth of donations. Um, and it was just, you know, having that space in in our event was just really awesome and there's no like formula for diving onto those moments but when you when you see it you really have to go for it um i would i i think that story is amazing uh and i i try to get uh chuck to to tell that whenever we uh we we are around any people um but yeah i just add like super super fun if you can add some sort of reward for the audience of, uh, you know, there's, you know, if we hit our goal, this will happen. So there were instances where like the Hamilton event, two cast members uh, switched costumes if they hit the goal and that helped raise another like $20,000. So it can be, it can be super cool. Um, I saw we had a question from Rachel. Um, Chasti, do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so my best advice, Rachel, if you're doing something, um, you know, uh, kind of where you're ongoing is definitely having a really solid MC who can kind of keep the, the train running and moving along um, in case, you know, you, you just kind of need that to like the program to keep going. Having a um, having at least sort of a roadmap of a script where you make sure that you're hitting whatever the key points are, especially with like it's for giving Tuesday. So making sure that um, the MC, the host, sometimes, you know, I think I've, I've worked with co-hosts before too, um, so that they can kind of like talk to each other, or go back and forth, but having that roadmap along so that um, you are hitting the, like, you know, what's the donation link every, you know, 30 minutes or so, but also like, what are the different topics that you want to make sure to hit? Um, if you can, if you have any like pre-staged content that you know, um, that you want to make sure that you get out there to fill the, those couple of hours and then do a run through, you know, it doesn't need to be, you don't need to do, you can do it in a zoom as a run through, but just kind of having people get comfortable um, and kind of being like, Oh yeah. Like, remember that story? Remember Chuck, tell the penis story, you know, <laughs> like, like having that kind of practice actually really does make a difference. And then, you know, having, if you want to have kind of like special guests, like pop in, like it feels really spontaneous had those kind of scheduled throughout so you you're not making people wait for longer periods of time because you know everyone shows up in the first hour and no one was told to come in the third hour but you have that really well scheduled out um and yeah i mean also like 
don't feel like you have to do it for that long. Um, we have found that I think sometimes um, doing something for an hour um, will be a much bigger bang for the buck. Um, and, you know, so you can reshare that content or you can cut up that content and share it in different ways. Um, you see my at Shasti Conrad. If you um, want to chat about it anymore, feel free to DM me. Um, but yeah, I th it sounds great. And I hope you raise a lot of money. Um, uh, I wanted oh, to yeah, it's uh, Albert. So I, by the way, I was told there's no like hard cutoff. So we'll, we'll, uh, get to Ali's question and then I think we'll wrap things up. Um, but there's no risk of us just sort of cutting to black David J style. Um, Albert, do you want to take the, uh, uh, the question from Ali? Yes, well, and at first I wanted to echo uh, what, what Shasti was saying about like, yeah, you don't necessarily need to do a three or four hour event if like the content doesn't demand it. But also sometimes it's better to make three or four hour long events, um, especially the way that like algorithms work. Um, if you have a live stream going on for too long, it's not going to like, you know, uh, rank well on the on the on, on social media. Um and yeah, and, and and also if you make several events, you can also target your audience a lot more because one is going to be about this, another one is going to be about that. Um, but I wanted to uh, talk about this, uh, the, the, the question from Ali about keeping uh, virtual events, um, you know, how, how it's changed the engagement mix and everything. I think we um, have to dissociate uh, the, for example, the fundraising and all this engagement from the actual event. For example, this 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 stream is an hour long, right? But because it's virtual, um, people are going to keep playing it later, and it's it's going to live there. And sort of understanding that it's not so much about what what you get in this hour, the fundraising, the money that you raise in this hour. All it, it it's really about how it how it lives. Uh, longer on the internet and how you exploit it uh, and how you extract the content and like you know segment it to like reach more people later on and it's a little bit what uh, Netflix uh, does with 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 its series and movies they're they're not all just economically viable with the first month where everyone's watching them they all bank on li leaving it there forever and it'll always you know keep making them their money it doesn't really cost them much to keep it up there um, so yeah, I think you just have to understand that there's a limited amount of results that you're going to get during the actual hour long or three hour long live stream, but that it's going to live there and that you have to find ways to keep extracting content from this thing you created. Um, yeah. I don't know if I responded much, I think <laughs> if anyone wants to, <laughs> yeah. um, I think you responded just great. I Someone had brought up, we did a rehearsal session and I think someone there brought up uh, the shape of the audience over time. Does anyone remember what that is? It's like a spoon shape or is it? Was... Uh, I forget the word, but it's true. It's definitely like there's a peak at the beginning and then sort of the long tail is how they call it on, on uh, you know, yeah. Netflix and these things, basically. You have a big peak at the beginning because it ranks high in the algorithms, but then it lives long and that tail is like never ending because it can stay up for years. Amazing. I will add um, for the fundraising piece of it, you know, one of the lessons that our team has learned is, you know, we were, you know, we come out of like advanced backgrounds and I worked with the surrogates. And so we were really um, confident in the run of show in the in creating really compelling content but we probably underestimated the amount of work that needed to happen to with the promotion side of it and then also on the preceding for the fundraising and so one of the things now is like we're really clear with um, clients like you know if you have a funder if you have a fundraiser on your team like they need to be as involved in this event as they would your annual gala like they've got it those relationships that you have matter you know you still need to call people you still need to send those emails and texts and get those folks to really um pay attention and and say that they're gonna either give beforehand or queue up a couple of people to give during your event 
Um, you know, sometimes we do smaller um, candidate events on Zooms, for instance, and like it really makes a huge difference to have a couple of people who when you get to the ask, it's like, you know, who's going to come in at $500 and you already know you've got someone who's going to raise their hand or like put in the chat, like I'm in at 500 and you'd be like, thanks, Allie or Rachel, you know, like, great. Who's going to match them. And having that preceded makes a big difference. And then having someone who is, you know, um, in the chat with the links and then also, you know, being like, wow, we just, you know, on the back end, wow, via Act Blue, like, oh my gosh, we just got $100 from so-and-so, like, thank you, so-and-so. Like, that stuff really does matter. Um, we did a, a sort of a, a fundraising gala for the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, and, you know, they raised the majority of their money beforehand, but it we rolled it out during the program as though it was happening live at the time. And then it was really just the last kind of like 10% that really needed to be raised during the actual program. And as we talked about before, like hitting those th like thermometer goals, you know, it makes everyone feel so much better when you're like, we did it, we made that goal. So I think working with that, and then as we talked about before around like cross posting and that promotion, like working with, you know, comms person or, you know, marketing um, and understanding how to do that online as well as your sort of more traditional media, you know, that that's just as important as it would be for any in real life event. Nice. I, yeah, I, I, um, I think all of that is, is super smart advice, um, especially the like, um, being a little bit liberal with how you are uh, sharing fundraising momentum about what what you already know is coming in um, and using that as as ways to kind of create energy during during the event. I think that can be super smart and I think that can make the the atmosphere feel really um, energized. All right, we're like, we're six minutes over. Um, we could probably talk all day about this. And I think all of us are are more than happy to uh, to continue chatting. So Shasta, you, you already uh, gave a shout out to adding you uh, and sort of getting in touch on social. Uh, I'll throw my email up on the screen. Um, yeah, uh, Jordan at hovercast.com. Happy to talk with anybody who is uh, is looking to do this. Um, I don't know any any plugs, any uh, any shout outs from Chuck Albert that you want to give as a, a parting note. Well, I'm always happy to um, you know respond emails and help. Um, Albert at act.tv, and um, you know you can reach out to our organization, and we have tons of people that can help uh, put together these virtual and hybrid events. Yep, um, I just put my um, contacts up on the screen. I'm Indel Chuck on Twitter and um, Chuck at wisdoms.org if you wanna reach out to me and happy to answer any questions about live streaming. Um, well, very cool. I'm just having fun over here. Okay, uh, with that, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll let our moderator go. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll, we'll talk at the next one in person, maybe. Looking forward right. to it. Bye, y'all. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Matt Roots.